Hello, everybody. My name is Michelle Palafis, and I'm the chairman of the Commission for Disabled Citizens here in the village of Hoffman Estates. We're so delighted that you spent your morning with us. You have a great lunch waiting for you. But on the end of Deb's presentation, I just want to take the opportunity to introduce some very important people to you. First, I want to start by introducing three of our trustees that represent our village that help to sponsor this event and many of the events we do in our village in Hoffman Estates. They are Anna Newell, Karen Mills, and Gary Stanton. And also our beloved Mayor Bill McLeod, who is a big advocate, as well as the three trust, all the trustees in our village for all of our initiatives. I'd like to introduce him, who's going to also introduce somebody very special to you. Let's hear for Bill. Nice to see so many of you here today and glad you were able to, to meet in our building. It is a public building. It's a people's building. It's my great, great, very great privilege now to introduce someone who has a distinguished record of public service. Congressman Peter Roskam has served as an Illinois State Representative, an Illinois State Senator, and now is the Congressman for the 6th Congressional District, my Congressman as a matter of fact. He's also the Chairman of the Ways and Means uh, Subcommittee on Tax Policy. Good, good guy to know in that regard. <laughs> so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Congressman Peter Roskin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you all for the, just to, the chance to stop by. And I know I'm between you and lunch, and I completely get this, <laughs> by the way. So let me be, let me be brief, but let me kind of get right, right to where I think we need to get. Um, there's, I think, a sensitivity and an awareness that we need to be um, we need to be very wise. We need to be very holistic in how we're approaching a lot of the challenges that you were talking about today. Your willingness to come out here, hosted obviously by the village and others, um, to to have discussions about those that are dealing with developmental disabilities is something that we can't do enough of. So as we're moving forward, there's challenges in Springfield and there's challenges in Washington, D.C. But I think when all things are considered, I think if we, if we continue this level of dialogue and discussion, we're realizing, I think everybody realizes that, look, we're all in this together. And there is a notion, let me just give you one quick example on tax policy. And I know it's gonna feel like I'm gonna put your head in a bucket right now. I'm not gonna put your head in a bucket. I'm, I'll, I'll come back and I'll rescue you. But there's, there's two things that are particularly interesting as it relates to you. There are people who serve in Congress that have children with special needs. And what has happened is that number is growing. There's more and more of them. And they're bringing an awareness and a sensitivity just sort of based on reflecting the public at large to say, look, this is, this is what, we've got dealing, uh, what we've got going on. On my committee alone, there has been a very in, uh, distinct interest in trying to figure out longer term solutions here. So one of them has been the, uh, the creation of the ABLE Act, basically, which allows money to be saved tax free and tax deferred and tax advantaged to, to give families with the resources the tools to be able to do that. That's a good step. It's a step in the right direction. It's not the whole package entirely. There's another issue right now, and I'll close by saying this. There's another issue that, that's before us right now, and it has to do with low-income housing tax credits, for example. If you look around, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of opportunities and ways in which uh, housing has been enhanced that, that goes through the federal tax code. If it's tinkered with, if it's diminished, it has a negative impact on the financing of these various projects, and I think it's quite self-evident that what we need are more of these types of programs, not less of them. So in the discussions around tax reform, for example, there, there is a growing understanding that we've got to make sure that these types of things, number one, are protected, that in the course of tax reform, there's no harm that's done to them, but also to be thinking, what are the things that can happen to not just do no harm, but to actually make them better. So, 
head back up out of the bucket. I rescued you. And, um, but I, I would really just welcome the chance to be in discussion and conversation as things are, are coming up. But just the fact that you're here today on a beautiful day and you're, and you're fully engaged on this is, um, is number one, very impressive. But number two, it, it gives voice to these areas where we need to give voice and have a discussion. So I think I'm between you and lunch. So as we say in Congress, I yield back the balance of my time. And I'm sure you've got a great meal ahead of you. But thanks very much just for the chance to be here today. Thank you. Our next speaker is Deb Hamilton. Deb serves on a volunteer basis as the Legislative Affairs Director for iPad Unite. Illinois Parents of Adults with Developmental Disabilities, an organization dedicated to advocacy and support for Illinois families. If you're not familiar with iPad Unite, I really encourage you to learn a little bit about it and join their Facebook group. It's a wonderful asset to be able to ask questions and learn about things that are going on in the disability community, uh, community here in Illinois. Um, Deb is a lifelong Illinois resident, a mother of three children, including a young adult daughter with physical and developmental disabilities. As a member of the iPad Facebook group, I can tell you that Deb approaches her position with extreme dedication, perseverance, and most importantly in the state of Illinois, good humor. So please welcome Deb Hamilton. So just click on the right. So I am a mom, and like all of you, I put on my mom jeans one leg at a time. There's nothing special about me, except that I got a little angry over time uh, about the state, the condition of things for adults with developmental dis disabilities here in Illinois. So um, I, th I firmly believe that out of adversity, some good things can happen um, here in Illinois. Uh, we are the definition of, of, of adversity. So I want to talk to you a little bit about how I turned that around a little bit for our state this past year. Um, I think it's important for you to know that my fancy title, uh, the iPad Legislative Affairs Director, is a title that I invented for myself. <laughs> so when you volunteer, you can pretty much do whatever you want to do. <laughs> I could call myself Queen of the Nile, and nobody would even uh, notice that, probably. Um, this is one of my favorite poems about making good out of things that seem like obstacles. Um, when I, uh, kind of my background is my, my daughter was born in 1989. And um, by the time she was, uh, before she was even sitting up firmly and walking, I, I got, angry about the condition of things for adults, uh, uh, the, the conditions for things, uh, the conditions for people with adults. Let me start over. <laughs> I'm still angry. <laughs> uh, uh, when I found out that it was a lottery system that, uh, that created um, an access for people with disabilities in Illinois, I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe this is the state I was born in, the state I was married in. I, I had been working and a taxpayer, and I thought that things were better than they were. Well, they're not. Uh, we still have a lottery system here in Illinois, and it's done a little more um, thoughtfully than it was when my daughter was just a, a tiny tot. But um, it's still a slow process uh, for, for people. And, and that frustrated me. Um, so I decided I was going to do something about that. And if you just continue allowing things to happen the way they're happening, nothing will change. So I was sitting talking with a senator, Senator Terry Link. He's um, uh, the, the third in succession in the state senate. And we were having this unusual dance of a conversation. I had my one pager with all the bills I was concerned about. I was talking to him about those bills. And he didn't want to get into the weeds of those specifics with me. He wanted to have a bigger, broader, more general conversation that I needed to hear. And he said, you're affiliated with a rather large organization, and I said, you know, about 1,500 parents. He said, you should be doing more. 
You should be on social media. You should have a website. You should do a scorecard. And I had seen scorecards. I knew what they looked like. I knew that for the size of state we have, there aren't very many in Illinois. And I used to be a teacher. So I knew how to write report cards. So it just kind of clicked with me that this is what I should do. So that's what I did. Um, last year I wrote the, um, the Illinois Community Living Report. I call it iClear in conjunction with iPad. And um, this is the cover page for it. Um, I came to find out after I wrote it that it is the only, the first disability specific report card or scorecard in, in Illinois. And then I think, and I can be, um, I'd love for you to correct me if I'm wrong, I think it may be the first disability specific scorecard in, in the United States. I can't find, I can't dig up another one. I can't find another one. There are more general scorecards. There are scorecards that are generally progressive or generally conservative. There are, um, you know, NRA has one, Planned Parenthood has one. There are other sorts of scorecards, but um, I think this is the only disability specific one in, in the United States. We had, as an objective, we wanted to reward uh, legislators who had done well, and we wanted to also motivate other legislators to do better in the future. So that was, that was our general motivation. We also kind of wanted to, um, we, we thought long and hard about the pro this process. So I looked at the scorecards uh, that are currently, um, that other organizations are doing. I literally, I printed them off and I literally tore them apart. I, I threw away the elements I didn't like. I restapled all the elements that I did like and used that kind of as a template. We selected 10 bills. Uh, we wanted to make sure that, that all 10 bills had passed out of both chambers because we wanted to score the governor. We wanted to make sure those bills passed along to the governor's desk, and so we gave the governor a score also. Um, we took a really tough approach to absences. One thing that, that w if you get into the weeds of looking at how these bills are voted on, you can really see that um, there are people who just don't bother voting. Sometimes they're not there, and sometimes they have really good reasons for not being there. Sometimes they're just too busy to, to bother voting. And it, all you have to do is ask an assistant or, or an aide to, to press the button. You don't have to physically do it yourself. So we took a really hard stance about voting patterns. And if you didn't vote at all, it was as though you had voted against a bill that was important to us. So some really interesting data came out of this, and we put it out there front and center. Um, we found that um, when we looked at the leaders' scores, that um, the governor's score equaled the speaker's score. And to me, this is an, an amazing metaphor for the budget impasse and for the loggerhead that we're at here in Illinois. Um, <clears throat> I, um, I had a, a sense as I was processing the data that this is how it might pretty much come out, but it came out exactly that, that you could see that head-to-head -head sort of combat there. Um, so we wanted to, um, to show people that right off the bat. Um, and we also wanted to um, highlight the people who had done, the legislators who had done very, very well and the ones who had done very, very poorly. Here are the 10 bills we selected. We were in favor of nine of these. We were only against the one, the one in the middle that's missing that blue bar kind of down the middle. Um, that's the bill that we were against. These are the Senate scores. And these are the House scores.
And then here's a little bit of end matter. And out of this end matter, you could really, you could see if you, if you um, need to go on our website or connect with our Facebook page or, or whatever, or email. The email uh, that's on here actually goes into my personal, gets sh uh, shunted into my personal email address. So if you have any questions after today, it's, it's fine to ask. Um, we really uh, use this document as a way to um, springboard out of the old Yahoo group we had been in and, and some of the, the maybe more passive forms of advocacy that we had done into um, a, a more significant um, a way of advocating. I love this <laughs> because relationships really do matter in advocacy and if you're going to um, uh, impact the legislative process at all, you need to develop a relationship with at least your senator and your representative. Even better, um, certain representatives or certain senators on select committees that are important um, here in Illinois. Um, I, I did go to the three legislators who scored a perfect score on the, on the scorecard, and I said, why, you know, there was this one particular bill that, that made you stand out from all the other legislators. What made you take the stance that, that we wanted you to take on that bill? And two of the three of them mentioned, one mentioned a self-advocate who came to him and said, I don't think that's a very good bill. <laughs> and they were right. And an, another uh, representative mentioned, um, uh, an iPad member, a mom, who had uh, come to her and said, yeah, that's not a good bill. I hope you don't you know, vote yes on that. And so two of those three, um, uh, Gazzardi and Necrits, had listened to what advocates um, were saying. And um, Ammons, um, when I asked her how, why she decided to vote the way she did, I said that she had called the Department of, of Human Services and they, they said, we don't think this bill is a very good idea. So, um, so you can see the impact that, that re those relationships can really have. <laughs> there, are, there are other ways to find who your, your mocks and gams are. And uh, a, a one really good way for Illinois, the, um, the, the <gasps> NEA actually has a really good website where you put in your address and it pops back up with, with your legislators. So if you Google NEA, Illinois legislators, um, that's a good way to find out who your Illinois people are. Um, I'm trying to think. There are some sites that will give you both your mocks and your gams. I really wanted people to see both of them all in a list because it, I, I wanted it to be more clear in your mind who was who. Um, because of this obstacle that I run in all the time where people will say, oh, Durbin, Durbin's my senator. And I'm like, well, he's, you know, he's not state, he's, he's federal. So, um, but I'm sorry that that failed. Th there'll probably be at least another, one more staff food before I'm done though, I guarantee it. <laughs> um, so, uh, Illinois puts out every two years uh, a directory and um, it's, this is the one for the 99th General Assembly. We are in the 100th General Assembly right now. Um, when you, in November when we elected a new batch, that new batch that was sworn in in January is the 100th General Assembly. My uh, state senator's office just told me this week that they are not publishing these for the 100th because of the budget impasse. So you can't, you can go get an old one, but you can't get a new one. Um, so there goes that. Um, th these are really handy though. Once they, they start publishing them again, it's really nice to have by your side. And um, the information can also be found on the ILGA website, ILGA.gov. And it's just a really good way to track bills, to find out where your senator or your representative is located, and to get phone numbers, email addresses, that kind of thing. Um, you can also use the dashboard on ILGA.gov to uh, register your opinion about bills, um, to register your support or your opposition. 
So it's a good site to use. I use it all the time. It's really nice to have a one pager when you go in to talk to your legislators. Um, this is a, a fairly complex one pager that Going Home um, has done. They, do a, they did a really nice job with this. It's a little outdated. Some of the information is not accurate anymore, but I loved this one pager. I hope they, they update it because it's good. But generally, my one pagers are just the bill number and big bold print at the top and a little paragraph about the bill. And you can leave it with your senator or your representative to, to, so that they know kind of at a glance what's going on. It's just a, um, and I've seen, and I've been talking to people before where they've, pulled, where they've rummaged in their stack of one pagers and pulled one out and said, what do you know about this? So I know that, they, that it's useful to, um, and, and um, it's a good tool. So one pagers. Um, there's a knack to this uh, advocacy. Uh, and it's like any relationship, any friendship, any, anything that you navigate, um, you, you want to be pleasant, but also stand up for your own rights and to clarify your own values. And finding that a tight rope is some, sometimes difficult for people, especially you know, if emotions kind of get the better of you. Um, but w w our job's to be angelic and polite, but also to be a little bit of a troublemaker and insistent. Um, so, I mean, the trick is, is, is to, so that people, you don't want people to, f to um, run and hide when they see you coming, um, but you also don't want to be um, a pushover either. So finding that balance is pretty tricky. There's also a concept I like. This is concept is as old as dirt. Uh, about 100 years after the death of Christ, um, this, this concept of politics being bred in circuses kind of came into, the, into writings. Um, and, and it's the idea that um, people get distracted by either what their, um, the handouts are given or by the political theater or the, the circus or the game, gamesmanship of, of, of politics. I need you to be really careful about that if you plan to be a really strong, strong advocate in Springfield or even uh, at a more local level. Because um, there are a lot of things that can distract you. And right now the budget impasse is one of those things. Um, it, you know, when you sit down and talk to your senator or, or your representative, they may very well want to discuss that broader issue with you you won't solve that problem yourself. And they can't even, most of them, solve it individually either. So it's good to not, allow, um, it's, it's good to not get distracted by that. Um, it's important not to pay, play party politics. Uh, leave that to them. That's, that's kind of their business. If you have a bill that you're passionate about, um, that's enough for you to discuss. You don't, there's no need to really uh, talk about the rest of it. Um, there's a lot of blame game going on. Don't get caught up in that. Um, and even, I, you know, I, and this is really a, kind of a temptation for people because legislators provide really good constituent services. If you're having a problem with, a, uh, with an agency in Springfield and you go to your senator and they help you iron out that problem, it's part of the bread and circuses. It's part of the, the, the distraction even. It, it may change the way you feel about that person. That person may not be voting to your child's benefit, but because they helped pave this one uh, way to, this, to resolve this one problem, you may not um, see that. Don't let that distract you either. Whatever good or bad comes out of that desk, um, just st stick to your, your mission. Um, it's, it's, politics is, um, it, it can be a really distracting game. Another idea that's just as old as dirt too, not as old as bread and circuses, is the idea that um, there are two things you don't want to be seen, you don't want to watch being made, sausages and, and laws, because they're both disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, they, and they both, uh, there's this, 
process they go through, where in the beginning, there's this beautiful meat, and by the end, it's unrecognizable. It's you know, a part of that process. Um, I'm going to um, play for you a little short clip from the musical Hamilton. Um, there's a, uh, in one of the songs, there's a reference to sausage making. And it's, it's uh, anachronistic, really, because this phrase didn't come into being until later. Um, but it's clever, because um, it, this song is uh, based on th the event where um, it's called the Compromise of, of 1790. And Alexander Hamilton was a Federalist, and he wanted the federal government to assume all the state's debts based on the Revolutionary War. And to do that, you would have to, of course, raise taxes and create a strong central government. And the southern states were opposed to that. So uh, Jefferson and um, Madison were, were opposed to this idea of assumption or assuming the state's debts. But Hamilton also wanted the state capital be, to be placed in New York City because he was a New York lawyer and New York was kind of the, the center of commerce and you know it was it was that's where things were happening just like now. So they got into a room and hashed it out and came up with a deal and that's why DC is located where it is in the southern port at that time this more the southern portion of the United States instead of New York, and that's why we have a, a stronger central government. So here's a little uh, isolated clip, not the whole song, just an isolated clip from that. Two Virginians and an immigrant walk into a room diametrically opposed, opposed. They emerge with a compromise, having open doors that were previously closed. Rose. The immigrant emerges with unprecedented financial power, a system that can shape however he wants, listen to that all day. <laughs> it's nice. Um, I think with my last name I should get a discount to the <laughs> but I can't even you know get tickets so um, <laughs> I don't know how that works. Um, the, the really nice thing about uh, state politics is you can be in the room where it happens. Um, this year I wrote a, a resolution that was passed and I, I literally wrote the legal uh, the legalese and it passed through LRB and now it's uh, you know it's a, a passed resolution. Um, there, there are times in the sausage, sausage making process when you can say here's this hunk of meat, make something of it. Sometimes you can say, ooh, I don't like those spices, let's tweak those spices a little bit. You can, most people wait around till the sausage is dumped on their plate. That's not the kind of people we are. We're the kind of people who care about this for our kids. Policy matters for our kids. Um, so uh, that's my little pep talk. Um, couple of last things. You don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. I have no clue what I'm doing. I'm not a paid lobbyist. I don't have a political science background. All I know is my daughter, and I know a vision for Illinois. I know that we can be a better state. And um, I, if I can do what I've done, you can do way more. 
Um, I couldn't even get the text to, to pop back at you the right way. You can do that better than me, I'm sure. Um, this is, again, remember, if you, uh, if you send an email to that uh, email address, it'll come to my personal email address. So if you have any questions or anything, and I will take questions now if you're not. If you have a question, raise your hand, but before that, how many of you want to like get on the bus and go see Hamilton right now? That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who has a question? Come on. All right, good, good, good. <laughs> to be good advocates for them, to influence our senators? Can you describe just a few things that we can do? I would establish a relationship. Get into the office with your son or daughter even. I t my, my daughter's not here today because she's at a, a, a special recreation bowling tournament in Westmont. But normally she's by my side and she um, and people People in Springfield know her by sight, and and they need to they need to see the whites of our eyes, uh, but not just your eyes, your if possible your son or daughter's eyes, and and and, and the more disruptive the behavior, the better. <laughs> and and I'm not kidding you. They need to know what our lives are are like. So if things get ugly and messy, well, you know, so what? Things are ugly and messy, and and they they should see um, the good and the bad. Uh, you know. Uh, all of that they, they need to see. Um, I, I've been in meetings with um, uh, with with people who, um, you know, have have done loud vocalizations and ha you know have really made it hard to think. I loved it. <laughs> I loved it, and and they, they need to see a little glimpse of our lives. Um, so I would just say establish that relationship. Now there's a pretty good chance that you're, uh, because it happen, has happened to me, um, my particular senator and my particular representative aren't on any of the committees that really have any influence over the bills that I'm interested in. So I still meet with them, they still know me, they know my values, but um, it, it's good also to target people who are on certain committees. And even better yet, if you're a voter in their district and they're on the right committees, then you can really um, hold a lot of sway. And I, you know, I mentioned those three uh, legislators who received our award for having a perfect score. And one of them had, uh, had met with an iPad mom. She happens to be on all the right committees, and she also has a good relationship with, um, with this iPad parent. So, um, so that worked out very well. So that's why I was hoping by the end of today you would all know who your people were. If you don't already know, and some of you are, are probably have a pretty good idea, really kind of firm that up in your mind, who those people are. and, and and meet with them. I think that's really important. And you said three things. I, I mean, I think um, it's really important to uh, notice what the advocacy organizations are doing in Illinois. So pay attention to what the Arc of Illinois is saying and doing. Pay attention to what iPad is saying and doing. Um, you know, just I, I personally um, also notice what Equip for Equality is advocating for. I notice what. Um, what Access Living is doing. So I, I kind of look around me and um, examine all the bills that are important to, to them because there's often, um, even if a bill isn't purely for somebody with an intellectual or developmental disability, sometimes there's overlap. And so I'm looking for those bills where there's, there's overlap. So just pay attention you know, to what, um, what other advocates are doing in Illinois. And, and I had to tell you, that right now I, I, I've been very frustrated because I don't know where to look um, because things that are happening at the federal level will have such an impact on what's happening here in our state. It's been very distracting for me. So I, you know, I've been, I feel rubbernecking, you know, back and forth between what's happening here, what's happening there, what's happening here. It, it, this is a very frustrating time. This is no time to watch TV or eat bonbons on the couch. I mean, this is a, a great, we have a moment in history where we can really um, make a difference as an advocate. So I would also say pay attention to what's happening federally and, and what some of those 
um, federal um, advocacy organizations are saying and doing too. The ARC uh, is good about um, keeping keeping you uh, updated. The ARC of Illinois does it at the state level, and then the ARC nationally does it for the, um, for the federal level. So, we have another question here for you, Jen. So this might be more of a logistical question, but I always wonder because I'm, I'm a speech language pathologist, and through okay. ASHA we can reach some of our representatives, but from a logistical standpoint, how do you get them to meet with you? Do you really do you go down there and have an appointment or do you just go down there and? That's a really good question. I'm surprised I didn't say anything about this. The, the toughest time is uh, when you try to get their attention in Springfield because it's so busy and their committee meetings and then they're on the floor and they're, you know, it's real, and, and then there, um, whenever anybody plans an advocacy day, then everybody floods the Capitol. So there are lots of, you know, public members of the public. It's a, it is a chaotic time. I have my longest and best conversations when they're in district. So you have to, on the ILGA website, you can watch um, the calendars and you, you, you can tell from the calendar when they're in session and when they're not in session. And there is ebb and flow to it. Now, because of Easter and Passover, we're, getting, we're entering a time when uh, they're not in Springfield. However, many of them are doing what I did on, during my, my husband's a school counselor. So we bugged out you know, for his um, spring break. So you're finding a little bit of that too. But um, in, in general, January to May is the worst time to get their attention because that's what, when the spring session, that's when things happen. So after May 31st, it gets a little easier to get their attention, but they've also made all their decisions for the year. So you have to really kind of time it. <laughs> Go for the long bomb. <laughs> No, a couple of things. Um, first of all, I just, uh, if anybody else had not found it, there's a, a website I found, uh, www.illinoispolicy.org. Um, and then you just, it says find your lawmaker, you just type in your address and you can find it. Oh, good. Is it just for Illinois? Yes. Okay, it good. Is, yeah. um, but also, um, I have never made an attempt to, to see my legislature, I guess, same thing. And if they are able, I mean, they give us time to see them. What would you, uh, of all the, the issues out there, I guess, what, how would you, what, what specific things uh, would you approach them about? What would you talk to them about? What is something, with all the information that's out there that we as parents can find uh, to kind of capsulize, uh, to talk to them about? Sure. Uh, right, right now, and same as last year, uh, the DSP wages bill is, really big because there's turnover in the cillas. They can't, they can't keep staff. And um, in, in most cases, staff members can go to Walmart or Target or McDonald's and make more money than they make in the cillas and not get su uh, subjected to the uh, complex work that a cilla presents. So the DSP wages bill is really big and it's it's the focus and the emphasis of not just ipad but also a lot of other advocacy organizations in illinois um, the the pay is really low and in most in most fields if you're having trouble attracting employees you do something to you know to change that you raise the wages you improve their their working conditions you you know you pat them on the back or whatever um, really there's not a, a lot that can be done unless the state decides to um, to raise those wages, so it's it's a, it's it's become critical, and also it's become oddly expensive for agencies because sometimes they're having to pay overtime to people to create coverage, and some I'm hearing um, I hope it's not true, but I'm hearing little um, you know little murmurings that some agencies are combining um, like they'll they'll put two silly, um uh, SILA members together into one house so they have coverage for the day or for the night or whatever. Um, and, without, and people don't have a choice. They have to leave their own home, leave their own bedroom, leave their own routine because uh, there's not coverage. So, so yeah, it's, um, the, the DSP wages bill is really big. And then there, you know, it would be nice to have a budget. <laughs> um, 
I firmly believe there's not anything I can say or do that would create that situation or prompt it. So I, I don't usually uh, go down that path with legislators, but um, but that would go a long way. Anyone else? Yep, Percy. Thank you. I really appreciated when you've given um, hints to us to fill out witness slips in support. Um, how effective are those witness slips? They're very effective. Okay. And es and especially so if I'm if I'm a senator and I'm in committee, and I don't know how to vote on a certain bill to get it out of committee. I don't know if I should be getting it out of committee or not getting it out of committee. I, I'll look to see. And it, the, if it's just your name on the witness slip, it means maybe a little bit less. But if I see that AARP is a, objecting to a bill, I might think twice about uh, about that. Uh, if I see the iPad, you know, has an uh, opposition to a bill, I might think twice about that. So it depends on who you're affiliated with, and I, and so I would get affiliated and use the bigger word. Um, you can use, still use your name, but when they ask you who you're affiliated with, then say, I'm affiliated with the largest organization in the world, <laughs> because it does get their attention. They notice that. And, um, and, it, and, it, and they balance, you know, politicians have to balance, it, it, it's a plate spinning exercise. They have to make not only their constituents happy, but, but also their party happy. And then their funding, you know, they need to think about how they're going to be funded for their next election. And, um, and, and they, their job is to please as many people as possible. Uh, and um, those witness slips really matter. They can be very frustrating though, because a lot of times committees will be scheduled and bills will be scheduled to be heard and then they might have to cancel the, the meeting and you may have filled out a witness slip and you think your job is done, but then they, they'll um, reschedule the committee and you have to you know, do it again. You have to really kind of keep an eye on, on all of it and it's difficult for most people to really uh, track and pay attention to. So that's why it's better to, to pick one bill, kind of stick with it and track it and um, uh, otherwise it, it becomes difficult. Um, but I know on the floor, I mean, legislators have told me when they're on the floor and push comes to shove and they're sweating and they don't know how to vote because maybe they're not on that committee and they haven't heard a lot about the bill. They don't, you know, they don't, they, they really don't have time to read all the language of all the bills that they're voting on. So they will look at, at to see who's opposed. It comes up on their screen there, right by their button where they're voting, and they can see who's opposed and who's, you know, who's for the bill. So it, it really does matter. It's just kind of a cumbersome, I find it an annoying pr process. And sometimes I will, get iPad all excited about, oh, we have to, you know, we have to register our uh, support for this bill, and then they'll cancel the committee meeting, and then I'll have to, you know, d turn around and do it a few days later, and it, it, I, I think people get largely confused by it because of not only um, it does, you have to go through that process in the House and then in the Senate, and then, I mean, it just like, it's a constant sausage-making pr process, um, and it does get messy, so. But thank yeah. you for, for, for posting those links because you've made it a lot easier. Yeah, the the, um, the GA dashboard. I don't know if I can go back to. I hope it shows on here. There it is. So you see in red it says GA dashboard. That you click on that to um, to to go to um, uh, register your opposition to a bill. So. Um, it, it, I think it's kind of a cumbersome system to use, but uh, you know, you, some of you are way younger than me. You'll probably be fine. Thank I learned you something. so much. Let's give it up for Adam.